sexual health is improved. Waking up in the morning, full salute. And that wasn't happening for the last couple decades, to be honest. So I, I don't know if that's from the carnivore diet or not. But I remember that happening when I was young. Now it's happening again. Is it the carnivore diet? I don't know. It's a true statement that I can make that there is a massive difference when I start eating more plant foods and I move away from from beef. And I and I can feel it. It's you know, it's 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 the depression comes back. It's the joint pain comes back. My bowels feel horrible. You know, I just wake up feeling like an old man. I, you know, it takes time for me to like work out all the joint pain when I'm waking up when I eat that way. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday morning. Uh, we have a guest today, Eric, uh, who I'll unmute in just a second. So anyway, if you have any questions for Eric, make sure you type them in the chat. Hi, good morning, Dr. Baker. Yeah. Me on again. Yeah, yeah, it's good chatting with you. I see the Regen, how do you say Regenarian? Regenarian. Yeah. Okay, so you're a fan of I've, regenerating things, I assume, correct? Yeah, and I've, I've renamed to Carnivorous Atheist. But I'm still into regenerative agriculture. Okay, a carnivorous atheist. All right. So you're you're a godless carnivore, which is you know we take, <laughs> we, we we accept all kinds. I don't I don't really care. You know I'm I'm into health and fitness and getting people yeah. healthy. So I guess let's just start with uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? What do you do? Um, and then we can get into um, just whatever we want to chat about today. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so my name's Eric. I'm uh, 45. I turned 45 uh, January 7th. I'm uh, I'm a nurse working in an emergency department right now, a level one trauma center. I have a have, I have experience in ICU, neurotrauma ICU, and uh, I was an electrician uh, before I became a nurse. So that's a career change for me. I've always been interested in growing my own food, kind of self sustainability, at least trying to move in that direction to see what I can do. Okay, so you're an electrician. So maybe you should went into uh, uh, you work in the uh, cardiac uh, electrophysiology lab or something like that. There's all the electricity there. I should have. I should have. Yeah, but I've got plenty of little jokes to make about being an electrician. You know, shocking people during CPR. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, hooking up, hooking up the monitors with all all the wires. I'm like the the wire specialist around there. So. So you said you've been, so you were elect, you were electrician, went into nursing, uh, and, and now, um, and you like to grow your own food, right? Yeah, I was really uh, thinking I was going to do like a food forest. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was going to do a food forest where I was going to be trying to grow as much of my own food as possible. Um, and then having such good success uh, with the carnivore diet and then, you know, kind of moving into whole foods, hyper carnivory, I decided I'm going to. I'm going to start raising my own sheep. So uh, I've, I've been spending the last amount of you know, number of months pulling the oleanders out of the backyard so I can have some livestock uh, back there safely. You know, we don't want them getting into oleander. It's a toxic uh, plant. And um, so I think I'm going to try give it a go, raising my own sheep and um, seeing how that works. I, 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 I raise chickens right now. I've done ducks before, but uh, my focus now is going to be off of the plants for food and i'm focusing more on the plants regenerating the soil creating the healthiest soil i can possibly create so that you know my my livestock are living in an environment where they're taking in the best nutrition possible yeah i, I hear a lot of a lot of folks that are into you know i i've actually talked to many 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 folks in the regenerative agricultural space and been on and visited several of them and and you know it's, it's just a bunch about growing grass and building soil is, is about raising a lot. Li raising a livestock is almost a side effect of healthy, uh, you know, healthy soil and, and, and creating this biodiverse, uh, environment where all the wildlife comes in and, you know, you, you know, the deal. So tell me about, um, so you were a nurse, you got into car, car a carnivorous diet for some reason. What, what, what prompted that? Where, I mean, we have some health issues. Um, yeah, I was, I've always kind of struggled with my weight. Uh, and along with that, just, you know, I, I don't control my intake very well if I don't have some parameters that I have to set up for myself. So I was trying really hard to make a whole food plant centric diet work mm -hmm. for me. I was doing a take on an Ayurvedic diet. Um, the book that I was 
kind of basing it off of was an Americanized version of an Ayurvedic diet called the hot belly diet. And uh, I was doing that for about nine months and just not. I was expecting because, you know, they say all the science behind the Mediterranean diet or whole food plant based is supposed to be so good that I'd have all these health benefits. I just didn't feel it. So I just had to say, you know what, the only way I'm going to know if this goofy carnivore diet that all these people are doing is going to be worth anything is just give it a try for a month. And uh, I felt so great after the month I've been doing it since what August 2021. Yeah, so, so that's that's what yeah. year and a half or something like that. So that's yeah. that's a decent amount of time. The hot belly diet, interesting. Is <laughs> that can make some jokes around that diet? I'm sure. Remind me again as a nurse, what are you? Are you in the, in the ICU or where are you working? Where are you working primarily? I was in the ICU during the COVID surges. I decided I needed a break from that. So after all that was settling down, I went to uh, emergency department. So I'm in a level one trauma center. And, and and you're in Phoenix or something, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which hospital are you at? Um, uh, John C. Lincoln Medical Center in uh, in the middle of Sunny Slope. It's uh, kind of a down and dirty neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. So you get all the... A lot of- you get a lot, a lot of drug overdoses, a lot of homeless, um, penetrating but trauma. Also, yeah. yeah, yeah, all the stabbings and shootings probably go with go there. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, we get a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Well, that makes it interesting. Anyway, you get to see some uh, pretty interesting, crazy stuff in the ER. I bet. What What convinced you? I mean, you said you had trouble in in um, uh, controlling how much you ate. You tried this plant based thing. Did that help at all? I mean, was I mean, because there, there's parameters in there. You know, don't eat meat, don't eat dairy. Eat, you know, whatever mm-hmm. nuts mm-hmm. and grains. A bunch. Did 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 that provide some level of relief for you at least? I think initially I may have felt a little better. I think whenever I initially start something, I'm probably doing everything better just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, exercising a little more, portion control, being more conscientious, and then after that, it kind of you know, fades away. So once that faded away, I didn't see really any benefits, but I was just having GI problems, you know, joint pain, you know, 43 years old. And I'm like, I feel like I'm old. I don't want to feel old, (laughs) you know? So that's, that's why I kind of decided I wanted to try something else because really the whole food plant centric thing, just, it, it wasn't the amazing, uh, there weren't the, the amazing health benefits that they, that I, I felt like people were claiming I would get from that. Yeah. Um, I, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I, obviously in this community, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of people that were on vegan, vegetarian, you know, some version of plant-based diets where it didn't work for them. And they found uh, sort of resolve or trying to in, in this, this style of eating. Um, did, did the people that you work with now, did you work with some of the same people back then? Or is it because you went to a new department? There's totally new people, I would imagine. You know, I'm back to the, I, I actually worked at this hospital like six or seven years, six years ago, um, before I was in the ICU. So there are a lot of uh, like doctors, like the hospitalists that I know really well. Um, a lot, some of them are actually doing intermittent fasting. That's what I was big into back then. And so they'll always come up to me, oh, you're still fasting. And they're like, no, not really. I'm doing the carnivore thing now. And, you know, we have nice discussions about, uh, you know, how to stay healthy and, um, you know, we're all doing our own thing, but. Yeah, these, these people definitely see a difference in, in, you know, they basically they say I look stronger. Like mm-hmm. I, I haven't been doing a lot in the gym, but I, I'm definitely putting on muscle mass month by month. Just I feel like naturally just because I'm an active person. Yeah, I mean, there's some evidence that going from, I guess, less bioavailable, maybe poor quality protein to higher protein in the diet will lead to some level of muscle mass. You're not going to get huge, but... Um, there, there's, I think there's data that would support that, you know, just by increasing your diet quality, you know, you can put on a little bit of muscle. So I'm not surprised to see that. Um, so when you made this decision back in August of 2021, and you said you did it for a month and you felt better, what, what kind of things have you noticed as far as, uh, differences in your overall health across the board? I mean, gut, gut health, probably better, but you know, you said you put on a little bit of muscle, anything else? I feel like sexual health is improved. So waking up in the morning, you know, with a full salute and that wasn't happening for the last couple decades, to be honest. So I, I don't know if that's from the carnivore diet or not, but I can say that prior to, uh, that wasn't happening. I remember that happening when I was young and now it's happening again. Is it the carnivore diet? I don't know, but 
it's it's a it's a true statement that I can make. <laughs> that it was not happening before, and it is now happening. That's what I can say. It's true. Sure. Yeah, I mean, and that's good. I mean, and as much as we j- joke around that, that has some implications with cardiovascular health. You know, it's it's all blood flow related, and. Uh, if blood flow is working down there, it's probably working pretty well in your heart. I can say at 56, I'm the same way. I wake up every day with, you know, a uh, state of arousal, I suppose. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting because if you look at, you go back to the origins of, say, the, the, the Kellogg's brothers and the cereal, and one of the reasons they were trying to get people off meat and onto cereal was they felt that meat induced too much of a lustful state and led mm-hmm. to masturbation and all this, you know, sort of religious sort of, stuff that went with that and there are, there's actually a nice study uh in one of the urology journals looking at um uh, erectile dysfunction to treatment treatment and they saw that carnitine which um is found uh pretty much ex- almost exclusively in meat particularly in red meat had a greater impact on erectile dysfunction than even to testosterone so uh, it may just be the high carnitine content that we're taking and, and maybe some other things going on that, that may lead to that so there is some science behind that uh, which is quite interesting to see. Um, are you uh, any family friends around you that that either yay or nay on this diet? I've had um, I had a coworker. She was a, a pharmacy tech, and she was on the carnivore diet. You now she had, yeah, I man. I'm not going to say much about her situation just because uh, we didn't talk about whether or not I could talk about her thing, but. Yeah, she, there were some some troubles she had from earlier in life, and and carnivore seemed to help with that. Other than that, not really. I'm kind of I'm kind of on my own. Yeah, yeah. And how hard do you find uh, to do that in a hospital setting? I mean, are you cook? Are you eating at work? Are you bringing your own food? Are you just relying on the cafeteria? Which, you know, in in, in my recollection, when I spent a lot of time in the hospital, I mean, you know, they had burger patties, they had eggs, they had bacon, they had you know meat on on the menu. So, I mean, what do you do at work? Yeah, I try and eat. I try and cook for myself as much as possible. It's actually really easy to get steaks or ground beef and just whip something up. I don't need, you know, a lot of people, you know, do all these fancy things making like carnivore breads and stuff like that. And that's great. I love that, you know, people are experimenting, but I don't need that. I just need a slab of meat or some ground beef and I'm fine. Uh, maybe some eggs. Yeah. So I'll usually make it up before work and bring it to work. And I, I don't refrigerate it. I just leave it in the container. I cooked it, put it in a container, and then I'll just, I'll chop it up before I go to work and I'll just eat it, you know, whenever I'm hungry at work. Um, so it, it's actually super simple. I, I, I'd i say it would kind of fit into a, a nice minimalism thesis. Like, you know, if you're trying to minimize your, your food prep time and your thought you know, all the, everything that goes into planning meals and making sure you get all your nutrients. It's the easiest thing you can do is just eat beef. Uh, you'll, from what I can tell, I'm getting all my nutrients. I don't have any deficiencies. I'm thriving. I don't have the depression that I used to have when I was on mostly plants. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting that you bring up the depression aspect because we've seen consistently a number of studies now um, do indicate you know, a relationship between depression and other mental health disorders and, and people that don't eat meat, whether it's vegan, vegetarian. Uh, and the thought is, is it causative? Is it, is it secondary? You know, some pe- people that are depressed decide to go vegan more often than not. Um, you know, there's a lot, again, once again, that carnitine molecule has been shown to be low in people, you know, serum carnitine tends to be low in people with major depressive disorder. Uh, there's concern around zinc and iron and, you know, dietary and low cholesterol variably associates with uh, depression, suicidality, violent crime. So there's a lot of things that are that are there to unpack around that with, with regard to mental health, for sure. Um, do you, so working in the ER, um, I, I, you know, obviously you get a little bit of everything. H- how much uh, of the stuff you see in the ER is, is related to, you know, chronic, you know, acute exacerbations of chronic disease, which are most likely diet and lifestyle related versus completely unrelated thing. I mean, even trauma, some people would argue is a lifestyle disease. You know, people have, a, you know, people getting messed up tend to be doing stupid stuff related to drugs and mm-hmm. alcohol and things like that. What do you, what do you, how much of that is, is dietary related and how much opportunity is there to even mention that in the ER setting? Yeah, well, if we start with like the basics, like the like debility, right? Like people come in because they're in their 70s and 80s and they fall and they break a hip. Um, you know, I like to talk to their 
family and say, look, let's talk about how we got to the point where mom or dad is so weak that they don't have balance and that their bones are maybe a little more brittle. You know, think about this as you're, as you know, as you're aging, uh, you know, how do you reduce the risk of becoming weak, frail, and brittle? And, you know, what kinds of foods can we eat that can keep our bones strong, keep our muscles strong? And then, so I just kind of talk about that. I talk about how, you know, beef tends to have everything you, you need and how meat's absorption is superior to plant-based proteins and that probably in the elderly as absorption becomes a little more difficult um you know plant-based absorption protein absorption probably goes down even more um i also talk about especially with people who come in with diverticulitis and i i try and make that correlation between big bulky stool in your colon and gas and possibly creating those diverticuli so that diverticulitis is can even manifest so those are two and then you know we talk about blood sugar stuff with my diabetics who come in um you know we talk about all the different ways that uh i what i try and do is lay out somewhat equally different dietary patterns and their health benefits but you know from my bias i obviously try and focus on the, on, on what i think is more rational and that's eating foods that are more consistent with the the default dietary pattern of humans so which is you know uh, lots of meat you know yeah before so, yeah i want to touch into that before we do that you mentioned that you feel that just eating beef is sufficient so i mean is your diet currently just only beef right now i mean i'm, I'm doing that right now i just did another month the carnivore month and i'm sticking with it i always feel good when i do it and i've done i've literally done two or three years in a row of nothing but beef but what, what are your thoughts around that and what are you currently eating today uh, I, I live in a household where, you know, I'm kind of limited on, on, on what I can do for everybody else in the house. I'm not going to make my wife eat this way. My daughter's 14. She l absolutely loves when I make steak. But, you know, the rest of the time I try and encourage her to eat more animal proteins if she can. Uh, she's a dancer. She's growing up big and strong. She's doing amazing. My little ones, you know, they're more like pizza and quesadillas and mac and cheese and all that kind of stuff so there's always something else in the house so i'm not 100 percent carnivore that's why i've always tried to say i'm hyper carnivore you know i'll eat other other things because they don't cause detrimental side you know problems like they do for a lot of people uh who who have like the autoimmune diseases and stuff like that but i'll have potatoes sometimes every once in a while some fruits and berries you know i'm the kids have out for lunch or they didn't finish it i'll I'll, I'll eat those. And I grow a lot of stuff in the backyard still. So I've got a date tree, a date palm. I've got figs and uh, mulberries and pomegranates and neighbors have all this citrus. And so I try and stick, if I'm going to eat anything outside of just beef, um, I try and stick with uh, a more whole foods, less processed stuff, stuff that I've grown, if I can possibly handle it. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, yeah, I was going to say, but I, am, I am mixed. I am a mix. I, I am it's a mixed diet, but it's at least 80 to 90% just beef. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's fair enough. I mean, I think a lot of people find that, uh, uh, you know, first step is getting adequate nutrition and getting enough, enough high quality animal products in is, is a huge win for most people. And if you can tolerate some other things, uh, I don't see a reason not to do that, you know, unless you've got some health issue or some sort of food addiction or, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to do that, but, but I mean, that's fair enough. Uh, well, you said you're raising your own food. What got you interested in doing that in the first place? I guess the the idea that I thought that food that I could grow by myself would be healthier, and I and I do just like just the idea of being outside, you know, working the soil, uh, getting my hands dirty. You know, there's there's a whole science to horticulture, so you know, just thinking about you know, how do I grow companion planting? It's just like uh, almost like a hobby too. It's something that I wanted to do because it's interesting to me and I wanted to try and, and, and provide me and my family healthier food. Um, and, and I've done that. I mean, I've grown a lot of things. So we still have a lot of stuff coming up. It, it's just something that's always, I love being outside. I love the sound of you know birds and 
uh, the, the leaves rustling in the trees. It's, it's just like, that's like my the sacred space, so to speak, you know, I don't go to a church. I go to garden. Yeah. I can imagine it's very different than the, the beeping and you know the, the yelling and screaming and, and swearing that'll go, that'll be happening in an ER, you know, is, is, you know, you're in Phoenix, so it's hot as we know. How hard is that to, to, to raise stuff out in the desert? I mean, is it, do you have any special challenges with that with water, for instance? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it costs a little more to, to keep the ground wet. So that's why keeping the soil full of soil organic matter is, is important. And that's why, like right now, if you go in my backyard, I've got big patches all over the place where I'm just letting the weeds grow. And, you know, most people call them weeds. I, I call them the, you know, the first plants to repair the soil from, from its, you know, state. And uh, it's getting roots into the ground. Those roots become fertilizer for the next planting. Uh, you know, I'm doing all the, the regenerative stuff I can out there. I, I, I have a neighbor who was just donating her horse manure. I've composted massive amounts of horse manure. I've got these uh, uh, bins in the front of the yard where my neighbors can put their compostable waste in and I'm composting that. As much as I can get that kind of stuff into the ground, I'm noticing I need way less water. And that almost provides all the nutrients my plants need to grow and thrive. All my plants are doing great right now, even in the heat. Now, now as far as you said, you mentioned, you know, chickens and, and maybe you're going to delve into sheep. Uh, how hard is it? How hard will it be to run sheep in, in that environment? You know, I usually, usually when I like, I, when I lived in New Zealand, there's sheep running around, it's all this verdant, lush, you know, temperate sort of climate. Uh, you see like, you know, Ireland and, you know, different places yeah. throughout the world. I don't typically associate sheep being out in the middle of the desert. How does that work? Or how, we, how do you think that would work? My backyard is verdant and lush. And uh, I think they're going to do fine. I've got I've planted these really nice shade trees that uh, they'll take the temperature down 10 to 20 degrees in the shade and, you know, creating more shade structures while those trees get bigger. And then, you know, when you have if I take little areas at a time and allow allow the, the plants to grow and water them that evaporation that happens from the plants over the time over the day, even in the hottest days cools the microclimate. So it it's really not as hard as you would think. You know, we get a nice little breeze. It's only that hot for a few hours of the day, you know, providing the, you know, the livestock with enough water and shade is, is really the best thing you can do, you know. But especially since my shade is biological shade, it's trees, it's bushes, those things actually cool more than just a, a normal shade structure because because of their water content, they're going to be cooling it, you know, even more than just if I were to just put up, uh, you know, tarps or, you know, some kind of roofing material, they can stay under shade and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. And then um, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, if, if you're going to get into agriculture, sheep are a lot easier than, you know, well, they're less expensive. They, you know, they eat less, they, they probably um, are, do you have any, any aspirations to go with, I mean, are you eating a lot of lamb right now, by the way? Cause lamb is, you know, not that con- It's great. It's a great source of nutrition, but it's just not very common in the U S one because it's almost all imported and it tends to be a little more expensive, but do you have any aspirations to put cows on there at some point or do you have the room? I mean, I don't know how many acres. You have. Looked, yeah, it's funny. I, I've looked into, you know, the smaller, uh, cow breeds mm-hmm. and, um, I wouldn't have any problem doing that. Uh, I think, I think what, what I would just have to figure out is, you know, if they're going to trample the ground because they're so heavy to the point where I'm not able to grow, um, grass sheep do a better job. And my understanding is sheep will leave a little bit of grass, um, as they're foraging. So you'll, you'll get a nice mowed lawn effect rather than, you know, rather than having them eat all the way down to the dirt. So, yeah, I, I, th- I think I'm going to s- try sheep because I think they'll, they'll handle the environment better and they won't ruin my environment as much as like goats. Goats will eat everything. They'll get through everything. They're a little hard to, to, have to manage, but I think sheep will do okay. And I, I get um, locally sourced um, lamb, J.H. Cattleman or J.H. something. He's up in Williams. Uh, Arizona, which is near Flagstaff, mm-hmm. and he ranges his his land, his sheep out there, um, and then he has a, a lady who 
who picks it up and sells it at the farmer's market down the street. So I do get lamb from him time to time. It's pretty good. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking because I used to live when I lived in Surprise and, you know, drive up north, you know, up to Flagstaff and then across over to New Mexico. You know, as you get up, you know, heading up north and you get up in the, into the elevation, it's very green up in there. And so there's a lot of a lot of probably decent grazing land up there. Um, yeah. Charlie's comment that sheep are tough to uh, keep alive in some way. And I don't know if that's due to their inherent vulnerabilities or predation or things. I mean, you got I mean, I know you got coyotes and stuff running around all over Phoenix. Um, any any issues with any concerns or issues with with how to how to protect them and, and what are you going to do about that? Well, I got the sign off from my wife that we can get a guard donkey. We were up at a winery, a local winery up in Cornville, Arizona, uh, over the weekend. And there was a donkey there. And I said, you know, babe, we're going to need to get a guard donkey because, you know, we lost 17 uh, chickens to a coyote attack a while back. And now I'm, we're down to four. I haven't, I haven't, you know, upped my numbers again because I'm still trying to figure out the coyote thing. But apparently donkeys will will kick a coyote's butt you know they'll they'll just like bite it and throw it (laughs) and uh they're pretty intimidating they're big animals so so we might have to get a little guard donkey first and then and then bring in the sheep so that they can be safe yeah interesting i've heard i've heard that about donkeys before actually so it's 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 interesting you know i'm just looking at the the you know you're in the er obviously you're at the you're you're the tip of acute care, I suppose, and the most acute care there is basically maybe outside of the operating room. Do you see any um, opportunity, uh, you know, I mean, any efforts to like educate people outside of what you're doing? Is there any concerted effort or is it just, hey, go home, take your pills, you know, whatever, whatever. Is there much concern about doing that that you see with with the physicians, the other staff? Are you asking if there are if there's any like lifestyle recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, any concrete lifestyle recommendations that would keep these people out of the ER consistently. Cause you know, you, I'm sure you see a lot of quote unquote frequent flyers where they're, they're in yeah. there every week, you know, particularly some of the mental health patients and stuff like that. Is there any, any, any help hope for that stuff or we just, you know, cause it costs a lot of money. I mean, ER visits cost a lot of money. Yeah. I think there's those people who no matter how much education you give, they're always going to be frequent flyers because they just, they have no idea how to handle their life. You know, there are a number of conscientious um, healthcare workers, doctors, and nurses, and, and and such that you know a lot of people are really starting to believe the intermittent fasting thing, and I think they'll every once in a while mention that. Um, a lot of them are are totally on board with uh, ketogenic and, and, and carnivore diets. Um, actually, there's a, a hospitalist who said that he tried the the carnivore diet for a month and he loved it and his mom does it and his mom has seen amazing results from it. But he he's kind of bound by, you know, some constraints somehow. He really can't talk about that with his patients. He feels like, you know, it's, it's not something he can do. Otherwise, yeah. you know, I don't spend enough time hearing how other people educate their patients to really know. Every once in a while I see it, but a lot of times it's just stop drinking, stop smoking, take your pills, exercise more, mm-hmm. you know, and and eat eat according to the recommendations. And I think people are just afraid to say anything beyond that. Uh, well, I mean, I think, and most likely most of those things go completely ignored anyway. I mean, it's just kind of like, you know, you, just, you almost do it as a perfunctory, just, okay, I'm going to tell you this. And then you know, it's like printing out the ER follow-up sheet. Well, and, and then the people who are really conscientious about that, I think they just leave. I think they just open their own practice and, and do those things where they don't have the constraints of the medical group they work for or the hospital system they're, they're working for as, you know, because their policies always seem to conflict. So if they get a little, a chance to, to but then they have to be, you know, business minded and they have to have, you know, the drive to do that. A lot of them do. I, and I think because they leave, I think we're kind of left with everybody who just plays by the rules. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. And how much, I mean, are they trying to, is there a, is there a push within the hospital to push towards plant-based lifestyle related stuff? Is, is it employee wellness? Is it cafeteria? Uh, you know, they have those things where sometimes they'll, they'll have these little, I don't know, go vegan month or something like that. Do they do that there? No, but everything says, um, you know, like healthy options. And then I look at it and I'm like, I don't know how you can justify saying that. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be healthy to me. Uh, and, and, and when you look at what the food that they make, I couldn't, I couldn't say that they're making any 
attempts to even offer healthy food at all, to be honest. I think really they're, they're kind of constrained by what will sell just like any other, you know, restaurant would have to, you know, placate to their customer base. You know, people come into a, a hospital, they're, they tend to be sick people. They tend to be people who are in families of sick people who may have dietary patterns that are very typical standard American diet. So they just kind of have to put that out there and then, and then they'll have a little salad bar and say they got a healthy option. It's, yeah. Yeah. Boring option. It doesn't taste good. Uh, <laughs> Heart disease, guess, no. yeah. Heart disease is something obviously people are concerned about with with those people that go on a carnivore diet due to concerns around dietary cholesterol, saturated fat, things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Are you are you concerned around around that? And then I want to ask you about maybe some of the patients you see with heart disease coming in the ER with with MIs and stuff like that. What what uh what are your thoughts on personally about heart disease, and then what are you seeing? Yeah, well, um, the last time I was on your, your podcast, I said I'd rather have a heart attack than be depressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hadn't had the courage to get my, my labs drawn. <laughs> so I was, I was afraid that my LDL would be off the charts and that would, that would mess with my mind. And I'd, I'd, I'd change my diet to something that didn't feel good. So they still kind of push the – I've even had providers tell me that I should worry about how much dietary cholesterol I eat, which now is, I, I feel is completely absurd mm -hmm. that they would say that even if they look in the literature, even if they look at the recent, most recent recommendations from the American heart and uh, other organizations, I don't believe that they say there should be a limit on dietary cholesterol. I think they've moved the goalposts to red meat and saturated fat. You know, I, I've seen some of your videos on like Frank's sign, and, uh, and we were talking earlier about uh, waking up aroused and how there might be correlations in sexual health. Uh, you know, with, if you have erectile dysfunction, you probably have heart, some kind of vascular uh, issues, probably some systemic atherosclerosis, which is, you know, uh, our, you know, hardening of the arteries or plaque forming in the arteries. So I see a lot of people come in with heart attacks and a lot of people with heart disease. And I, and I can attest to that. I see a lot of these people who have this diagonal crease in their earlobe. Yeah. So-called Frank um, sign. Right. Yeah. Frank yeah. Sign, yeah. And, and I talk to my colleagues about that and I say, you know, whenever you have somebody come in, if you have a code come in, you should really be, you, know, you should actually, there is justification to look at that and say, is this a respiratory code? Is this a cardiac code? If you see a Frank sign, you know, you've got some reasonable justification to assume that it's actually a cardiac code because there were some pretty well done studies, randomized controlled trials that showed like a 78 percent um, sensitivity to that Frank sign um, correlating with at least one coronary artery having a 50 percent occlusion. And, and that was all confirmed by, you know, CT and geography and all that. So. I see a lot of heart disease come in. These I've never seen somebody come in with heart disease who was on anything near a carnivorous diet. Most of their life, they were eating standard American diet. They're eating a lot of carbohydrates, you know, probably a lot of alcohol, um, a lot, you know, and, and they sometimes they look like they're in shape and they're fit, but their arteries are just either calcified or full of, uh, you know, plaques and foam cells. What, um, you know, it's, you know, when you think about this Frank sign, you know, you get this diagonal ear crease, you know, what the hell would an ear crease have to do with heart disease? I think, you know, I think it's, it's just an, it's just a representation of what's going on at a tissue level across the board. And, you know, you've got, um, you know, we, we think about the vessels, <clears throat> particularly the arteries and, and the coronary arteries when we're talking about heart disease. Um, you know, they, they, they take on some sort of characteristics of chronic inflammation, damage, and, you know, on and mm -hmm. on and on. And, 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 and later we see this atherosclerotic. Um, you know, plaque formation when you do you get a chance to look at the labs on these cardiac you know intakes you know do you see high cholesterol low cholesterol medium cholesterol across the board high trig low tr triglycerides do you ever do you ever like curiously like to see what their presentation labs look like yeah and they're all over the place some are high cholesterol some are low um some are high ldl some are low some are high triglycerides some are average i i, I wouldn't say that i see a huge trend towards uh 
uh, yeah. Uh, and, but I don't look at it that closely, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you probably have time. You're more worried about, you know, whatever the code stuff is, you know, doing that, pushing the code drugs, I guess. Yeah, I did write I did write a blog post about Frank's sign a while back. And when I was doing that, I was just kind of looking at the literature. I found a, a diagram of the ear and the vessels of the ear. Mm-hmm. And it turns out there's an artery that feeds the bottom part of your earlobe, um, or tri- like an artery tributary, I guess you would call it. But then there's another one that, that goes kind of up and comes back down that feeds the top part of your earlobe. Mm-hmm. So it seems as though that that capillary bed is the place where you see the tissue atrophy when blood there's blood. restricted blood flow. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with you talk about erectile dysfunction. You know, it's the same thing. It's just it's impeded blood yeah. flow for some reason. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I can definitely see, see why that's the case. Um, do you... Uh, I was going to say one of the reasons why I was asked to, to come back on your on your podcast was I actually did go back. I did finally get my labs drawn. Okay. And okay. my lipid panel improved from okay. where I was before. I don't know. I don't know if we want to go over any of that. But, sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, let's. If that's yeah. What, that. what was uh, what were the what were you doing before and how has it looked these days? So I I have labs from 2016, 2018, and 2022. 2016, I was what I would say is fairly, and I don't like using standard American diet because I think it has such a bad uh, connotation. I was trying to be healthy in 2016. I mean, that was like, I wasn't trying to be unhealthy. You know, I was, I was doing what I could with what was available to me. Um, at that point, total cholesterol was 141, Trigs 140, LDL 118. HDL 47 and A1C 5.4. Uh, in 2018, I was doing a lot of intermittent fasting in that same vein. Now, I would eat pizza and burgers and stuff, you know, burritos and all that. But I was trying, to, I was trying to still, you know, eat what I knew was available to me and kind of mitigate the negative effects of that with intermittent fasting. So 2018, my total cholesterol was 184, uh, triglycerides 96, so that came down a little bit. My LDL came down a little bit, 108. My HDL was was 57, so that improved a little. And generally, my A1C stayed the same, 5.3. And then 2022, one year hypercarnivore, my total cholesterol came down to 176. My triglycerides hit the floor, they're 35, LDL 108, HDL 61, and my A1C was still 5.6, so still within that normal range. Uh, I had heard that maybe red blood cells live a little bit longer when you're eating, you know, such, you know, when you're so well nourished that your red blood cells don't die as quickly, and maybe that can account for maybe a slight increase in my A1C, even though I was pretty much, uh, you know, you can see by my triglycerides, I wasn't eating any sugar. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that, that thought about the red cell life, obviously it's an estimate how long they live and will they live longer or shorter. You know, they probably do. I mean, you can, you can, you can figure that out. I mean, you can do things like fructosamine and I mean, or just get a, you know, get a CGM and maybe get, you know, or, or blood glucose sticks and kind of see what's going on there. But you know, regardless, uh, it doesn't look like it's significantly gotten worse. And I, I would say that those numbers are not, I mean, they're not, I mean, other than the triglycerides coming down dramatically, but everything else is kind of, you know, more or less ballparkish. It didn't change. It was like, same thing with me. I didn't, I didn't see really any change in my numbers going from what I had before to carnivore. They stayed about the same, you know, as far as my lipid numbers went. Uh, well, my, tri- my triglycerides got lower, my HDL went up a little bit, but my, as far as my LDL in total, and again, it's one snapshot. It's what was going on at, you know, 1052 that morning or whatever it is. So it's, it's fluctuating all the time. So I don't put too much, uh, I don't get too excited about, you know, one, one blood, blood result. But I think that, you know, the important things for me are, you know, blood pressure, you know, body composition, function, imaging, if you have some imaging or something like that, those things that tend to show what's going on on, a, on an overall chronic basis, which is, you know, you know, better, you know, better in my mind. Within the, uh, I guess, ER space, do you have any doctors that are just adamantly, you said you had some interesting discussions with some doctors, any of them thinking that you're out to kill yourself and 
um, you know, you're, 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 you're going to die and of a heart attack. You're going to be in ER with coding, with a heart attack, with a, you know, a, a, you know, a ST elevation MI and, you know, a year or something like that. Anybody, anybody talk to you about that? Yeah, I had a coworker. I, I love her to death. She's, she's a great nurse. Um, she has a, a degree in public health. So, you know, she was kind of like, Oh, I can't believe you eat this way. And, and, you know, I heard rumors that she kind of like was talking to my other coworkers about like, Oh, Eric's, you know, crazy to do this. It's so bad and everything. Yeah. I, I just, I don't take those things seriously because I don't take those public health recommendations seriously. I, I take what I experience by my self experimentation. I take that seriously. So I know that there is a massive difference when I start eating more plant foods and I move away from, from beef and I, and I can feel it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the depression comes back. It's the joint pain comes back. It's my, my bowels feel horrible. You know, I just wake up feeling like an old man. I, you know, it takes time for me to like, you know, work out all the joint pain when I'm waking up, when I eat that way. And I do experiment from time to time. So, so it's been very consistent in my self-experimentation. I, so I just won't, I won't take any of that seriously. And now part of the name change on my, on my social media is, is what I want to do is take a more philosophical approach to why I believe certain things. And I want to believe, you know, more true things and, and reject more false things as, as much as I can. And, and I just found like, from, uh, you know, if you look into philosophy, the, the, the field of epistemics is basically saying, you know, how do we know things? Mm-hmm. And I feel like what's happened is we've given away our own ability to think and we have started to trust other people too much because a lot of the truths that are important and consequential seem to have to rely on other people, you know, uh, scientists, uh, you know, epidemiologists, all this kind of stuff. But when I, when, when those kinds of recommendations come down, I can't say that I really know them because I don't know whether the, whether the, the research was uh, intentionally altered. You know, I follow this, this lady on Twitter, Elizabeth Bick, who points out a lot of the research has things that are just completely fabricated with Photoshop and, it's happening all over the place. So I don't know that the researchers were truthful, that there weren't uh, monetary, you know, uh, financial motivations for them to skew results. And then I don't know that the people who put these meta analyses together uh, actually know what they're doing. And I don't have the ability because I don't have this, I don't have the training to read those things. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, I know what I know. And I know that when I put certain foods in my mouth, and I eat them, I feel a certain way. I can tell that. And I know that for myself. And nobody else can take that away from me. Yeah, no. yeah I mean, it's a very, very, very for, fair point because, you know, when we look at, you know, people tell me, well, I eat, if you don't eat the, if you eat a certain way, you're going to get cancer and heart disease. We don't know when it's going to happen. Maybe 20 years from now, maybe 30 years from now, maybe 50 years from now. There's no way for me to know that. I mean, honestly, I don't think there's any way for them to know that, to be honest. But what I can do is, I, like you said, I know when I eat a certain way, how I feel, how I function. And that's that's something that, like I said, when you talk about what can you know, that's something you can clearly know, or most people can. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to tell somebody you don't feel better. Well, it's, it's all an illusion. You know, well, I, the, 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 the 40 pounds someone dropped or the fact that they're no longer requiring medications or their blood pressure's normalized or they don't wake up with you know, chronic pain every day. I mean, those things aren't, you know, illusions for, for that person. You know, it's, it's, it's actual real stuff going on. And so, yeah, I agree that, that, you know, it's, it, and how much science can you trust now knowing what we've seen with conflicts of interest and how, you know, some studies are designed with a, with an outcome in mind. I mean, the outcome is already determined. They just do the study to corroborate the, the outcome that they desire in many cases, depending on who's paying for it, of course. Uh, I think there, there are some good, ethical scientists out there and trying to do the right thing, but sorting them out from the ones that, you know, kind of just doing it to, to crank out papers and get more funding is, is, is definitely sometimes hard. Is the plan to continue working in ER, growing some, growing some crops? Do you have any other sort of 
aspirations, I guess. I know you're, you're doing your own personal philosophical sort of growth, but anything else you're thinking about doing? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've kind of thought about ways to get out of uh, bedside nursing. I've just got some ideas floating around, but nothing super serious, you know, starting a little uh, mobile IV business, but I really have some limitations right now. So my wife works at an emergency department three days a week and I work at an emergency department the other three days a week. So I am just kind of right now thinking, when am I going to get to the point where my kids are independent enough that I can start a business? And I, and I think I will at that point, uh, something. And, and if not, um, you know, I'm, I'm planning on starting a blog, keep doing my, my social media stuff and maybe try and turn that into something that would offer enough value that I could justify turning, monetizing it somehow. So maybe that's in the future. Yeah. What I, I know you've been, you've been fairly, you know, and this is a controversial topic because you, you said you worked in the, in the ICU during, during the height of the COVID pandemic. So you saw a lot of people obviously in there, many of them probably died. One of the things that really frustrated me, and I know there's, this is just, this is just a can of worms here that, you know, it's, you know, it's all vaccines, good, bad, COVID real, you know, whatever was it released from a Chinese lab, who knows. But the thing that frustrated me the most was, you know, the absolute absence of any sort of concern or emphasis on improving, you know, lifestyle exercise during this entire time. Did you, did, did you see any, any attempts by anyone in, in any power to say, Hey, look, maybe it'd be a good time to maybe eat a little better, you know, get a little exercise. I mean, something that could have easily been done. We had so much resource poured into this and the fact that it was completely ignored, ignored at least on a national policy level really was frustrating to me. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? I didn't see any, anybody talking about that at least. And I don't know if there would have been an, um, an appropriate space to speak about that, except for maybe among coworkers in the ICU, you know, I, we're not public health, so we don't, send out messages to the public. Mostly what we do is just, you know, if we have any possibility, we can just share our experience, which is what I, what I tried to do. And, um, and just to, just to, I mean, again, cause I've heard from a number of people who've worked in these situations, the people that were getting sick, that are ill, that were innovative, that died, were they generally comorbidity related, obesity, elderly, you know, diabetes? What, what were you seeing? You know? Yeah. For the most part, Definitely um, larger body sizes. If they weren't larger body sizes, there was definitely at least one com comorbidity like, uh, you know, hypertension or diabetes type two. It was fairly consistent. And then the age. Um, so older people were definitely affected more than younger people. Uh, you know, I remember hearing a story of a young guy coming in, you know, he had athletes physique and, um, something happened to him, but you know, we don't really necessarily know that it was COVID that did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been something else that was going to happen to that young man, you know, regardless. But I also noticed a trend, uh, you know, when you talk, when they talked about the, the different cultural group, well, different groups like, you know, um, Hispanic, you know, African American, mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain that, but I did notice that a lot of the, a lot of the people, when I would do like zoom calls with their family, a lot of them had a lot of family living in the same house, like tons of people, mm -hmm. uh, especially up north in, um, on, uh, you know, in, in like the reservations where a lot of people live in, in one house, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Navajo Nation, places like that. And I think that there may have been a viral load component that also was, was harmful. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I don't know for sure. But I can only imagine that with so many people in one house, you know, it doesn't matter what disease it is. I would say that it would be more likely that it could become severe because they're increasing the vir viral load in the environment. I don't know if there's anything to that. It's just something that I noticed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no doubt. I mean, as we have more and more hop higher population densities, I mean, obviously communicable diseases are going to spread more easily. You know, you go to Tokyo, Japan, and they've got literally 35 million in the metropolitan standard area. I mean, it's just monstrous. And so... Let me ask you, because you sell social media, so you've changed your name from regen, Regenerianism. <laughs> for a hard time See, nobody can even say it. Nobody That's can say I'm it. I, mean, I, had, yeah. I had to change that. Regenerianism. Uh, to, You're uh, a what? You're a Regenarian? What? Yeah, Regenarianism. 
um, yeah. to carnivore atheists. Are you getting, um, well, first of all, share, because we're running out of time here, share where people can find you. I know on Twitter I see you sometimes. I don't know if you're on Instagram or some of these other places or YouTube. Share where you are so people that want to, you know, just follow up can find you. And then are you having a lot of negativity on social media? Because some people do. When you start talking about meat is in a positive way, we always hear the kind of the vegan trolls come out of the woodwork to, to tell you how bad an awful person you are and how stupid you are and yeah. how you're going to die and get heart disease and on and on. We always hear that stuff, but where, where are you located and are you getting much pushback? Yeah. So I'm at carnivorous atheist on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I spend most of my time on Twitter right now. My goal being on Twitter is to engage in meaningful debate with people who have different ideas than I do. Uh, I want to have my ideas challenged. One of the reasons why I really appreciate Dr. Baker is that you say, I don't know a lot. Is this true? I don't know. Is this true? I don't know. And there are a lot of social media influencers out there who are saying, everybody needs to do this. They're making a lot of absolute statements and I don't feel comfortable with abs absolute statements. So what I'd like to do is uh, uh, I'll eventually start the blog. I bought carnivorousatheist.com and I'll be blogging about my experience, challenging myself to take a skeptical perspective on pretty much everything. And because I am a carnivore, I will be taking that as my default position. So a default position like basically says, prove it to me, right? Because the burden of proof is on the other person making the claim. So if a vegan comes to me and says, meat is bad for you, I'm going to have to say, well, you're going to have to prove that it's so much, so bad for me that I should actually consider not eating it anymore. And that's the really hard, I, I hold a, that to a really hard, high bar. You know, you're going to have to pr provide a lot of really, really good evidence. And it's going to have to be more than what I've experienced. You're going to have to provide evidence that, that's that shows me that my experience is wrong and i don't think that's going to be easy to do uh, anyways that's that's where you can find me good so. okay well again like i said we're running out of time thank you eric for doing this appreciate it keep up the good work mm -hmm. we'll look forward to seeing you battling people i i, I kind of you know i've kind of lost in I, I never had much interest in fighting with people online but sometimes i engage in it in kind of a humorous way or try to but um because i find that you know engaging with vegans is you know, like I said, it's like, it's like debating a chicken or something like that. It's just, they're, they're not going to change. You, know? you got to wait for their teeth to fall out and then they change. Anyway. Okay, guys, <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. Everybody have a great day. Thanks everybody. Take care. Eric. Bye-bye. Grab me. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye Dr. Baker.